It is the third day of May. A thousand Irish people representing the whole country from the Gap of Dunlow to the Glens of Antrim are gathered together in Rome on the Irish national pilgrimage led by Dr. Dalton, Archbishop of Armagh. E.P. O'Reilly was there and he recorded the songs that filled St. Peter's when the Holy Father received the Irish in public audience. Our special greeting to the Irish national pilgrimage. The church had never been so strong as it had been in 1952. We were timid economically. We were timid in regard to the health services. We were timid naturally educationally. Four or five years of economic decay, of continued emigration, of large-scale unemployment, these were years of co which could be described as if the country had a death wish. Here are the morning prices on the Dublin Stock Exchange. 4% conversion loan, 100 and a quarter. 3.5% war loan, 92 and 7 eighths. Lincoln and Nolan Holdings, ordinary, 7 and This is the um, day room of the barracks uh, in Coot Hall. Uh, my father was the sergeant here with three or four guards. Nothing ever happened. They were lined up for inspection at 9 o'clock every morning after the barrack orderly, the B.O. they used to call him, left up his bed. And uh, then they cycled out on empty roads on which nothing ever happened. And they came back here and wrote reports, uh, which they used to humorously call patrols of the imagination. Forecast for the provinces, Leinster, Ulster and North Connaught, cloudy or dull, with rain... The barrack orderly had to be here day and night. And the way he'd pass most of the day was standing at that window, looking at who crossed the bridge of Coot Hall. And on good summer days, they'd take a chair outside the window and sit watching who crossed the bridge. Before the news, here is an SOS message. It is for Hayden, last heard of in Cork in November 1951, and believed to be traveling in Ireland with Duffy's Circus, go to St. Patrick's Hospital. I think that the abuse of authority in Ireland is associated very much with uh, the principle of fear having been abused and distorted. The nature of spirituality from a previous century had been entirely changed with a highly organised church. That church in itself, as I remember it in the 1950s, was one in which their authority and view was unquestioned. As a child in County Clare in the 1950s, I think Maybe the most lovely thing, well, my uncle and aunt always got the paper, but the paper in Linton times would give itself entirely to all the Linton pastorals that included every word, including the cross, 
down at the end of it and the name of the bishop at the end. The way in which sermons were delivered, the way in which condemnations were issued, were ones that had very little to do with spirituality, which is a word I don't recall hearing being used in Ireland until the 70s or 80s. I think that you have the Catholic Church there, which has suddenly assumed great influence and power. You know, we had missions in Milltown and, uh, you know, they were banging the pulpit and, you know, the people that didn't go to Mass were made to go, you know, I saw a poor man, or I heard of him being driven up to the to mission, you know. They went out on the sand tills, beating the grass for court and couples, you know, that was wrong. The Ten Commandments were being imposed, all right. Having a priest in the family was uh, regarded as a mark of very great distinction. You know, to have a son a priest for an Irish mother was a confirmation in her faith, you know, but for the whole family it was the same thing. And of course, for the priest himself, uh, he was uh, looked up to in a way which I suppose may not have been altogether healthy. I keep saying to young priests today, you know, that when I was your age, you couldn't fall if you tried. You had so much social support that perhaps you could lean slightly sideways, <laughs> but <laughs> that was about as far as you could get. Sometimes I think if you look at any great organization, that people can get carried away with their own power, and individuals can, you know, feel that they're either their God or that God sent them to do something. And, and I think that the Catholic Church went wrong in many ways when they felt this power. Just as I've seen politics and, and politicians go wrong with the sense of power. Bishops referred to themselves as princes of the church in this period. And as well as that, we all passed institutions into which people were, were locked and contained. God knows under, as we now know, under appalling conditions. How people can refer to the 50s as a time to which we should return, I cannot understand. Fry Cadbury, makers of Cadbury's dairy milk chocolate, present the Kennedys of Castle Ross. We are a possible sweepstakes program for your entertainment. And remember... The end of the 50s was the GA, the Fianna Fáil party, an establishment that was utterly and completely Philistine. The arts meant nothing. So you couldn't call yourself a painter, you couldn't call yourself an artist. You were just a fellow who did something. On a wet Sunday, or you went out on an evening and you did something, whether it was a drawing or a painting, but you didn't call it art, because art was something would have, would have been achieved by somebody maybe from Middle Europe. Nobody from the countryside would have been able to achieve anything like that. I suddenly came to the realization that we dared to be ourselves through the medium of games. I never thought we'd have a coin of our own or an army of our own or a flag of our own or anything like that. And here came up out of the clay up around us came an organization called the Gaelic Athletic Association, which says we'll imitate nobody. Cusick founded it with his colleagues in 18, 
1984 for the purpose of lifting a people whose spirit was almost dead after the famine and the immigration which followed it. What a local club does for community spirit, the attachment to a place, I think that is very important in this country. It still retains that uh, huge involvement with people at a local level in the rural areas, in villages and towns, and in the cities too. You could say politically, they had, of course, an unapologetic stance. And uh, they have always been associated with the Catholic Church. And of course, that was inevitable because the majority of the population were Catholic. But once someone jocosely referred to the association as Fianna Fáil at play. I think that there was a very cosy relationship between the church and the Fianna Fáil party and teaching as well. I think that the same triumvirate that organised the parish pilgrimage to Knock would probably organise the common outing as well, if the common had an outing. It's about people and players. The pride of county comes into it then. But that clannishness or tribalism, when I use that word favorably, is there as a part of it. The only thing we had to do was play football. Born in Isolation, that's all we done. We played football, went to work, went to school, played football, and we talked it. And that's all we had. Now, there was no television or anything like that in those days. I remember walking three and four miles. If you had a radio then, as you used to call it, wireless, you were um, high up in the world. We often had to walk three or four miles to listen to a match. So, listening to a match, didn't I thought me hollow here on Crow Park was something of this world. From Winchester Avenue, Chicago to New York, just to hear the game. We salute the many Irish in Rome. And in this year of celebration of the San Systems, we salute a community which owes so much to Father Luke Waddy. From Cove come salutations to a son in the Collegio Missionari Porta Latina, and down Wicklow Way and in Offley, they're thinking today of a son in the American forces in Karlsruhe, Germany. Just as an aged father in Perlis has thought today, especially for his son in the GA Ben was, I suppose, the most controversial subject, even taking in political ones, over a long period of anything else in this country, and I'm not speaking of sport. It excluded members of the GAA from playing for stated games, rugby, soccer, hockey, and cricket. And also, it barred them from attending those games or supporting them by going to dances promoted by clubs of those games. And uh, if a member of the GAA did infringe that rule, he was suspended. In Northern Ireland, the ban meant that you couldn't be a member of the Gaelic Athletic Association if you were a member of the British Army, the RUC, and certainly the B Specials, but anything to do with the security forces, and you were out. So that meant that the GAA was a very strong nationalist organisation that didn't uh, transcend the, the, the political or dare one say, the sectarian divide. But as time went on, and particularly when it came into the 20s, it should have been dropped, but it wasn't. It remained a source of controversy and bitterness and hostility among sports people. It was only 
after 1971, when the ban was taken away, that the GAA really entered into the full mainstream of Irish life, that they were able to become not just respectable, because that wasn't really what they were looking for, but they were acceptable to everybody. In a bandless GAA, let us maintain the spirit that made this association great. Let us remain a national organization, pledged to work as always towards an Irish Ireland, proud not only of our games, but of our language, our songs, our dance, our nationhood. There were bans that impinged upon this whole societal thing, including the, the, the Ney Temeray decree, which was a ban, which virtually uh, prevented any uh, Protestant w with a conscience from marrying a Catholic. It made, made life very difficult. It prevented intermarriage. Perhaps it helped in some ways to preserve the few Protestants who were there, I don't know, uh, or else they, they moved abroad and married other people. But that and the ban on Trinity set a kind of two nations, as if there weren't two nations, but it, it, there was definitely a them and us. Protestants went to Trinity, Catholics went to UCD. The churches were radically different. You couldn't... Uh, uh, fish on Friday, you couldn't play soccer if you played Gaelic, uh, you couldn't read certain books, you couldn't go to certain movies. There were all sorts of things you couldn't do. And we liked that. I think actually people really liked not being able to do things. It was a denial of the flesh, and flesh was a very bad thing. Living with Lynch. I fitted myself back into the society, which was mainly at that time pubs staying open very late, with a few girls around who were attending the bar, and you were trying to bang them up against the door, if you like, but nothing you were doing. And you got home late at night, wet and drunk. Someone said once that the past is a different country. To me, the 50s weren't as black and oppressive and awful, as is now being said by historians and columnists. Who didn't, some of them, live through it at all? Hearsay, how, from whom, though? Of course there was emigration still. Of course there was unemployment. But when I moved to a man and came to Dublin in the 50s, I don't remember that it was as oppressive as people are now saying. I'm speaking of someone who had a job then. But there was also a lot of gaiety. People drank in pubs. The theatres were open in the cinema. I went to see Waiting for Gatto in his first production of The Pike. Things were happening. I went to hear Salvador de Madariaga in the Shelburne Hotel about 1954 when I was just finishing my studies. He was a liberal in exile in Oxford who came over and the, the hall was packed. And he spoke to us, and it was heady stuff. He said that the future of Europe was coming from the peripheries, and that we were part of the periphery, and the Scandinavians and the Iberians and ourselves, and in our hands lay the future of Europe. Now, nobody had ever said that to me before. But, I mean, that was part of the 50s. So there were people, there, there, there were influences that were coming and going. I have no memory of John Charles McQuaid and the Catholic hierarchy and De Valera breathing down my neck. I went around a free man. I found people who didn't have jobs or poor jobs. And there was a great resilience. I remember speaking in the dialogue the twin evils of unemployment and immigration. And it was hopeless. We were going to die as a nation. And that, that, that was the lowest point. 1955 is a crucial year because it is in that year the failure of this appalling conservative economics is at its greatest. 55,000 people are fleeing from the country. We must remember Pather O'Donnell's comment. I said, you've got to remember, Dev, that nearly a million Irish-born people emigrated while you were Tisha. And he said, ah, be fair now. If you had been in my place, they would have gone too. I said, it's quite true that if I had been in your place, there might have been a quite a big number of people who left Ireland. But I'll tell you one thing, Dev, 
they would not have been the same people. The 55,000 that were leaving were people from small farms, people from the crafts, people from the cottages, uh, people who were going to join brothers and sisters. The country was being emptied out. It got worse. Uh, by 1958, which was the peak year, 80,000 net left the country. Uh, this was the worst ever. This, this was the background against which economic development and, uh, arose. It was the psychological implosion of the country. It was the utter failure that we, we faced, which probably sowed the seeds for change. There was a bit of spirit in it because I was at a wedding and there was a man and there was a bottle of whiskey and it was going down very fast and he said, look, the vanishing Irish. So he made a joke of the book that was out at the time, you know, because they were sensitive to it. You see, you know in a parish, the teams are losing their men, you know, they, this is the great thing in a parish was a team. Emigration was what they thought of as soon as they came to school, leaving age. I did go to school here in Ancaran Roar. I'd say a third of these emigrated to England. Some of them went on to Boston after that. They would plan ahead and another uncle or maybe a neighbour would um, stand for them, they used to say, M meaning that they would take him on and get him a job and look after him for the first couple of months. Sometimes the uneducated were people who weren't very clever. But uh, there was a lot of people in the national school that would have done better when they went away had they been educated. And again, I heard people cursing the teacher in their school because he didn't bring them up to the standard of the teacher in another school. So I became very conscious of the need for education for the immigrant to give them a chance. The normal movement from rural Ireland or rural anywhere to a town in Ireland was to English towns. So you had lots of the people. Many had gone to America. The letter from America was important still, sending money home. I remember being at a house and the hackney car was bringing the youngster up to the station. And I heard the man saying to his wife, that's the last of them over the hill now. He had 10 children, all immigrated. My memory is, you see, reared near a railway station was of people leaving. It's always about people leaving. The 50s is always about people leaving. It was hard on the mothers. They'd see the young girls from down the line still crying. They'd try and look away so as not to make a scene. But you couldn't avoid their eyes sitting there, red-eyed. And then there was the guard's whistle to stand clear. But the clutch and cling, laying out the carriage window. And you'd hear the engine getting up ahead of steam and the carriage couplings jerking alive. And they still run the length of the platform holding on. Frankie Byrne with another edition of Woman's Page, a programme for or maybe about you. Now, the problems I'll be discussing today may not be yours, but they could be someday. Good morning to you all from Chivers, makers of the famous jellies, jams, marmalade, jelly creams and custard powder. We present this evening all our friends of Irish music at home in Ireland or across the Irish Sea. A very happy weekend. And Walton's last word is, if you feel like singing, do sing an Irish song. Delaney got up, he's joined third. He's just got Rixton standing Houston ahead of him. They're coming into the stretch and Delilah looking very strong. 
What strength as he goes past Rixenstein? Houston is choking and Delaney is going by. Delaney is going for the tape and Rixenstein coming up in the second place. Here comes Landy in third place. He's gone up level to Rixenstein, but Ronnie Delaney takes gold for Ireland. Delaney in 341.2, then Rixenstein, Landy, Tabori and Houston. A new Olympic record. Good morning, everybody. We present Music While You Wake, the programme designed to start you pleasantly on another day and brought to you by Gala, makers of the famous lip line, nail colour and fashion match cosmetics. Males who immigrated in the 50s emigrated to a very narrow spectrum of jobs. Buildings, some in pubs and something like that. A small number moving outside a few categories of work. At that time, we had this vast surplus of, of, of labour, most of it unskilled. Uh, but in a sense, we were in the fortunate position uh, that we had uh, an adjoining country, uh, which at that stage had a large demand for precisely that sort of labour. Uh, it also had a significantly superior social welfare system. Uh, so that form of immigration uh, became uh, very attractive. Women, on the other hand, many of them went to nursing, but they also married outside of the community. Women were far more likely to make their way into British society in an integrated sense. And almost everybody in Ireland at that stage had people living in London, uh, Manchester, Glasgow, uh, you know, Birmingham, uh, and so on. Uh, certainly myself, I would have known uh, the streets of London significantly better than the streets of Castle Bar. We were all the same. We were all Irish somewhere else. Then we had no local radio stations. We had no sort of newspapers which told us what the Irish were doing in Manchester, Liverpool, or Edinburgh, or Glasgow. You know, we really found out our own information, in a sense, through the church. Because you knew, in fact, on a Sunday, that if you went there, you'd meet other people from the four provinces. After 12 o'clock mass, you had the hall around the back of the church where people congregated and they talked about the GAA matches. You know, did Leash beat Kildare or was Kilkenny? How did they do against Tipperary? I mean, I was entrenched, but I loved it. But it was a great sense we were all the same. The one thing we had in common, we were all Irish. But we were Irish, we were exiled, we were away from home. Yet, there was a community of spirit there. Towards the end of the period, people who had jobs were leaving. People in insurance companies and banks were leaving in groups to give their children some hope in another country, Canada or America or Australia or somewhere. That was the extent of this, which morale collapsed. And it wasn't a question of that irritating thing, the best went. The best, the middle and the worst, everybody went right across. And it took a conscious decision, and even with a conscious decision, it was only if you had the opportunity that you could stay. It really was a draining, it was a hemorrhaging of our people. And it was not acceptable, and that had to be stopped. The IRA never goes away, and one became very conscious of this in the 1950s, the mid-1950s, when they embark on this uh, cross-border campaign. Um, this is uh, one of the most serious uh, restructuring uh, of the IRA to have taken place since the 1930s, and casualties are taken on both sides. The extraordinary funeral of South and O'Hanlon with huge crowds as went through Dublin, and then the extraordinary turnout of clergy in Limerick. This would always arose, the same kind of feelings in people in Fianna Fáil, because they came from the one root, if you like. There was a feeling the state itself was at risk. A lot of people felt that independence perhaps had been a mistake. I was at a function, Tom Barry unveiled a monument down near Milton Melby, and 
One of the phrases he used, let us throw it all back into the melting pot. Get it all back and we'll start again. There's no melting pot. Here we are, we're left with a state which some people regard as unfinished business, a lot of people, and a big number in Fianna Fáil felt the same way. But you had to take over the state you had, you had to run it, you had to provide for the people, you had to educate the children in it. Republicanism would incorporate a great deal for Fianna Fáil people. I mean, it wouldn't be just a literary political term. It would be a whole host of meanings and feelings and emotions. And most Fianna Fáil people, I think, would like to believe that they were in the mainstream of Irish nationalism. Now, I don't suppose they would attempt to go back to O'Connell or anything like that, but they would certainly like to look back to Parnell and uh, right through from Parnell up to date. Div and his government, the Republican Party there, they kept the belief that one day we would have unity in the country, but they also were moving towards the non-violent attitude. The uh, ideal of an, a, an Ireland united, uh, covering the whole island of Ireland, which always seemed to your ordinary Fianna Fáil person to be the natural order of things. That the, the uh, idea that six counties should be taken away and separated and isolated, if you like, from the mainstream of <coughs> the Irish nation, uh, it just sounded a bit, it was, it was, it was an anomaly, uh, something that wasn't right and that basically sooner or later uh, these th th that would be put right and Ireland would be won. De Valera called a meeting of the party and we had a whole day meeting discussing what is our position now. I remember a man calling to me before I left Spanish Point to go to the meeting and he says, don't let the boys down. You know, there was strong feeling and a strong feeling in Fianna Fáil that you shouldn't do too much against them. I mean, if, even if we in Fianna Fáil have gone away from this idea of violence, you shouldn't be too hard on them. There was, a, there was a, some of that feeling among the public. It was a separatism, you know. They, uh, they would, be, would, would be totally devoted to the idea of a separate, independent, sovereign Ireland. Now, insofar as that uh, Britain uh, obstructed that uh, ideal anyway, then there would be uh, anti-British to that extent. But it wasn't a sort of a, a, a real, live political culture of being anti-British. It was more being pro-Ireland than anti-British. At one stage, I remember Sean Lamas jumped up. Somebody said that peaceful means have failed. And Lamas jumped up and said, peaceful means never got a chance. And he developed that, but it was to show that we did not believe there should be any other army but the army of the government. The meeting decided that it would not be a good idea to use force anyway, and they left an open-ended about how we go about finding our way to the, the, the main ambition of Fianna Fáil. While this cross-border campaign was going on, Southern Ireland was in a shambles. Southern Ireland was not participating in the European, Western European economic boom. And more shameful than anything, the sanatorian Ireland were filled with the other disappeared. There were the disappeared who left to emigrate to England and America, but there were the disappeared who had TB. I know two who got tuberculosis. They went pure of anything to protect them. Into a city, somebody coughed, and the next thing they had what they call galloping consumption, the tuberculous pneumonia. It was only when I had the leisure of lying on my back with TV and coughing up into a blue bottle that I decided I might 
do something like that again. I made drawings just purely selfishly for myself. In both the mash, the install can wheel can haul, we some ain vas the hoona, the dutsa, a gas bin mish a home law, we shall slaw on the kine. If you can share the manish, Edin draw, Kadani and boss, whom say ye hennes, is Gamegan, Dosi Gale, Massin Gadin, Luchard Beha, a Suli Kale, came after him win. Jim Deeney in his autobiography describes the morning in the Custom House when they realised for the first time that there were no new cases of tuberculosis coming in. And that, for people who had despaired during their lives of ever tackling the disease, was, was a major turning point. I believe, frankly, that the biggest failure in Ireland has been an administrative failure. It began disastrously as a post-colonial adaptation adapted to the worst elements of a late imperial ethos. It never had the courage to change. It is very wrongly described as being innovative in the 1950s. It was not. Well, by 1958, uh, in terms of uh, one's capacity to earn a living, in terms of one's general life chances, people were still hugely dependent upon the inheritance of property. It was a society dominated by farmers uh, and small shopkeepers. Uh, it was a society where the rules and regulations uh, relating to moral behaviour uh, were still those characterised by what has been called uh, Catholic moral monopoly. It was a society where if you'd gone away for 30 years and uh, came back, it would still look extraordinarily familiar. Somebody recently said if you appeared in Dublin in the late 50s, uh, the new Bussaurus building would have struck you as new. Everything else would have been uh, almost entirely familiar. Happily, uh, politicians, if they make big mistakes, and I'm afraid big mistakes had contributed to the fact we had that period of stagnation when the rest of Europe was growing, if they make big mistakes, they can learn from them, and our politicians did learn from them. Here, I'd give electricity to the countryside. Now here, I am doing it for you all. We brought power to the mountains, we brought power to the glens, we brought it over rivers, lakes and streams. We had every kind of hardship, but we'd do it all again. The pioneers who built the rural scheme. We were the pioneers who built the rural scheme. One image I have in my mind is my mother sewing with her Singer sewing machine, a hand sewing machine. And every so often she would curse because the thread was breaking. And afterwards, only afterwards did I realise it was breaking because it was shoddy thread made in Ireland behind protectionist barriers with no competition and no improvement in the product. Our trade was totally dominated by the United Kingdom. At the time of independence in 1922, something like 98% of our exports went to the United Kingdom, Britain and Northern Ireland. By the 1950s, it was still 95%. There'd been no shift at all. Ken Whitaker and others battled with the more conservative industry and commerce where Sean Lamass was uh, as a minister to try and get the civil service to think in terms of changing from protection to free trade. The civil servants under Whitaker had moved in to fill that economic void. That economic development was a epoch making document at the time. The response of politicians was one of great relief, I think, that from the most unlikely place in the world, some constructive, positive suggestions had come for new policies, new approaches, which offered a better chance, a way out of the despondency. It was a frank acknowledgement that protection had failed. It was also a challenge to make the Irish economy internationally competitive and start competing um, in a, with, with more modern industries and move away from agriculture. 
my recollection is that there was virtually no opposition. In fact, I don't even recall that the programme was debated in the Doyle at the time. The psychological impact was enormous. And I think it was a, which of course would never say this, but it was a recognition of the fact that the old politics had failed. You cannot blame the politicians of the 20s, 30s and 40s for not having systemic plans, because nobody had systemic plans. Keynes, the greatest economist uh, of this century, basically produced an economic analysis that permitted countries to plan systemically and look at the relationships between the sectors. We adopted that way of thinking only in the late 50s and early 60s under the influence of people like Professor Lynch. People felt basically that the policies pursued have been so unsuccessful we should now do the opposite and hope for the best. So where we had restricted foreign investment, we financed foreign investment. Where we had done nothing for exports, we encouraged exports. For protection, we came out for free trade. And that reversal of policies produced an immediate effect. And then on, growth continued. A free trade economy had been done in Europe in the 19, late 40s and the post-war period. And now Ireland was desperately, a decade later, tens of thousands of people having left the country, trying to develop a, a, an open economy. It was, I think, John Fitzgerald Kennedy who said that the role of the expert was to examine a problem to a conclusion. The role of the politician was to examine it to a, a decision. And indeed, it is the decision of the minister, the decision of the government, which is the mainspring of activity in every department of government. Eamon de Valera resigns in 1959, but of course he goes on to become president. When the time came and I went in to say goodbye to Eamon de Valera because we were in the same constituency, and he said, a fresh breeze will blow through the country now. Now, in retrospect, afterwards, and hearing people, we all would have felt it's a pity it didn't happen a couple of years ago. But I don't think that the government would have put forward Le Mas so easily some years before. That was a very strong government. There were strong tensions, and they, brought, they did great work. But I think Dev delivered Le Mas into that situation, and that he held on till he was sure of it. Remember that the people running the state at that stage had been there for a very long time. They were actually very conservative people. They were not radical. They were nationalist revolutionaries. They wanted independence to create their own state, but otherwise deeply conservative. Some of them quite extraordinarily conservative, like Sean McIntyre, my father. Um, and if people are conservative when the revolution is at the age of 25 or 30, what are they like at the age of 70? So I think we did suffer from the fact that they stayed too long. That's the trouble about a successful revolution. It's a fact of history now. It's no good speculating about it. These are, you know, let, let historians and philosophers uh, um, argue about these things. Uh, the only thing I can tell you is that uh, what Lamas did when he came in. It's not because we don't realise the nature of the odds we have to beat. I think he took Ireland, economic Ireland, by the scruff of the neck, gave it a great big shaking and maybe even a boot uh, in, in, in the behind uh, and, and set it on a new career, a, new, a whole new path. He took the old Fianna Fáil agenda and to some extent the old national agenda and defined all these new objectives largely in terms of national objectives, in terms of patrioti patriotism, in terms of a new form of patriotism. He believed that government departments should be development corporations, his own phrase, that government departments should be active, should in fact act. Lamas was described as a gambler. He was described as a philistine. He was described as a lot of other things. And um, like everybody now has put the halo around him. And, and he's a man for whom I have great admiration. And indeed, my father had great admiration. But let's not pretend that suddenly everybody was wait that first of all everybody was waiting for Lamas. As it turned out, he was terrific. Lamas certainly was an organized person. He had a fantastic capacity to 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 concentrate work. I'm totally committed to Lamas. What he did was for me exactly what I wanted to happen out of politics. And and, and he wasn't new like I was. 
he was very much a, 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 a nine, or even a ten to five person. And the mass didn't believe in, in, in you know, big long hours a day. If you couldn't do it within a lot of time, then there was something, you were inefficient, there was something wrong with you. It was my idea of a meeting. It was over quickly. And if you didn't know what you were going to say, you, were, you didn't get to say it. You know, it, it had to be precise and clear. Oh, punctuality, yes. And I like to think that I learned my punctuality from him. He was absolutely, uh, totally committed to punctuality. He used to say that, uh, that uh, a, uh, <clears throat> a punctual person in Ireland wastes an awful lot of time. I think of Mr. Lamas rather as a political leader, a government minister, who has uh, certain uh, social ideas, you might say social consciences, who saw before him certain immediate tasks to be carried out uh, and tried to accomplish those tasks. But he has never appeared to me uh, to be a man with a deep understanding of economic problems. Uh, he has been acting on a pragmatic basis uh, with no very clear ideas as to what would be the ultimate social or economic goals to which he should direct uh, the economic development of the country. The biographers have not yet captured the real mass that I would know and that lots of others would know. And in fact, I go a bit further, and as far as I know, there's only one really good portrait of Lamas ever painted, which is, I suppose, the other side of the same coin. Well, the one that I have uh, by Sean O'Sullivan has the tremendous, the tremendous power, you know, the, the sheer dynamic power of the man comes through the canvas even. I've heard him say uh, that if you lose your sense of humour, you're scared of politics, and he was almost certainly totally right about that. But uh, that was one aspect of him. He, 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 he wasn't a light-hearted sort of person, but he did have all the time that slightly humorous way of looking at most things, no matter how serious or difficult they were. You see, the mass had a fantastic sense of duty. Above all else, he had a sense of the fitness of things and the duty and what he should what he should do and aspire to as Taoiseach uh, and as a political leader. And that manifests itself in a hundred different ways. Many historians underestimate the role that Ireland played in the United Nations. It was some years before Ireland was admitted to the United Nations, but as Taoiseach, Sean Lamass took a very active part in deciding how Ireland should vote, should behave in the United Nations. And I think that uh, Lamass's role in foreign policy has been ignored to a large extent, and which means that the main contribution he made to Irish policy is not yet fully recognised. The price has always got to be paid for peacekeeping. In the Congo, we lost 26 dead. The homecoming of coffins from the Congo led to an enormous outpouring in Dublin, November 1960, when nine members of the Irish army who had been killed in an ambush in the Congo were brought home. And it was one of the biggest crowds ever seen in Dublin since the state was founded. If you really want to change things, you can only do that through direct political action. And I suppose that would be my um, real motivation in going into political life, because I realise that uh, the, uh, the country I lived in and the community of which I was a part had a long way to go, had an enormous amount of things to do. For instance, uh, eliminating the, the residue or the that persuasive uh, neo-colonial feeling uh, and to, to, to catch up, put it mildly, with the rest of Europe. Mr de Valera did a very good job, even by going to the park, which I'm sure he didn't like doing. He certainly told me that he wasn't that anxious to go there before he went. 
Yeah, I think he was fulfilling a duty. I think that, in fairness to Mr de Valera, that he had kept some of the native capitalists and the native industrialists in their place because he didn't trust some of them. Uh, some of them he saw as having a foreign origin. Uh, I'm not so sure that he really accepted the Guinness family, for example, in its entirety. I also think he was suspicious, and correctly so, of some of those who had seen when the state was likely to catch on that they would make a, a good business sector out of it. Uh, rather like a Brinsley McNamara story, you could put the plan out on the sitting room window over the pub because you thought it was going to work. So de Valera moved into the presidency. In fact, funnily enough, I was standing outside the GPO. We lined the route, I remember, for Dev, and the big black car swept past and swept into history as far as I'm concerned, because that was really the end of de Valera as a political force. He was gone. <laughs>